Kia ora, I'm Claire Finlayson, Programme Director of the Dunedin Writers and Readers Festival. The 2019 festival recording that you're about to hear was brought to you with funding from a copyright licensing New Zealand grant and with the support of ORFM. This session, Scylla McQueen, was chaired by Richard Reeve and presented by Otago University Press. Enjoy. I should be standing up to a certain degree, but I'm going to sit because the seats have been placed here for us. My name's Richard Reeve. Um, I'm here, it's my delight today to be here with Scylla McQueen, who is the, um, the subject of today's uh, meeting and, of course, anyway, the, the, the Oracle of Bluff. This event is being presented by Otago University Press. We have one of the two publishers here, Rachel Scott. Um, just thank you in advance and we'll thank you again. Rachel's been a staple um, of Otago University Press for now seven, six years. Um, and Otago University Press, of course, is Scylla's publisher and has been for quite a number of years, both under the present publishers, Rachel and also Vanessa Manhire, and the previous publisher, Wendy Harricks. So our guest today, Priscilla Muriel McQueen, known by everyone as Scylla, of course, was born in 1949 in Birmingham. She arrived in New Zealand in 1953. As you all know, she is one of New Zealand's most loved, most highly esteemed poets. It's been recognised not just in the informal accolades poured upon her at events like this, but additionally in the fact that she has been the recipient of the Prime Minister's Award for Literary Achievement. She has been a recipient of a honorary doctorate, honor, an honorary doctorate of literature from Otago University. She's a former poet laureate, and notwithstanding having vacated that position, in our minds, she continues to be an honorary poet laureate of New Zealand. She's a former Burns Fellow and a former Fulbright Scholar. She's published, I say, at least 15 collections of poetry to date because commonly smaller publications are not listed among her numerous publications. Um, I have one or two at home that she has kindly given me in the past, um, beautiful little things, and I don't see them often listed in bibliographies of her work. Recently, 2018, she produced this book here, Poeta, selected in New Poems, which was intended to be a whoops, crash, capacious uh, selection of her work. It's by no means the uh, totality of all the poems she's written, but it's a go-to compendium of work. And um, the questions I'm going to be asking her today largely chime from the contents and structure of Poeta. So the overview today is that I'm going to ask Scylla shortly to read an introductory poem and we're going to have a discussion about certain themes which I have suggested to her are salient in her oeuvre to date. And then we're going to give an opportunity for you all to ask questions should you so wish. Um, we had allocated a smaller period of time but we've actually extended that to 20 minutes at the stage so I hope in the course of hearing us discuss today questions will arise and you'll be able to at that time anyway address them with the Poet Direct. So, oh, at that point, I think I'd like you to put your hands together to welcome my guest, if that's okay, and then... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm unaccountably nervous doing this because usually when I'm reading poetry, I have my book and I have my poem which I've to read, which I've worked on and worked on for ages, and I know it's okay. Um, however... My ordinary talking is just as scattered and flu as everybody else's ordinary talking. So if I say silly things or say many things far too often, um, just forgive me. I thought I would just start to, to uh, centre myself, really, with a, uh, a little meditation on the nature of fame, the uh, elusive quality of fame and the um, um, fleeting quality of, flame, of fame. And it started, it's, it's, I'm reading it because it's a poem in which I um, took part very, very briefly and then wished I hadn't and then sat down and wrote a poem about it from the point of view of the victim, which was a slater. After a testing climb, I reached the top. But success was so dry, my carapace curled around my segments and my legs froze. Not knowing where I had come from, she tossed me out the window. I was a slater of renown. 
I climbed 10 stairs all on my own. <laughs> so there you are. It's later. So, Scylla, are you that Slater? <laughs> well, I must say, I, it, it had not occurred to me until that moment mm. um, that every human being makes enormous efforts to get where they want to go or to go through life even without even trying, you know. So I did become, for that moment, that Slater, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I didn't find that much success, quite honestly. <laughs> However, to, you know, to, to manage to write poetry all my life, and to stay alive at the same time is actually pretty amazing. <laughs> so, I know of your family, first of all, your, to my family, famous mother, Marion McQueen, mm -hmm. and your equally famous father, Garth McQueen. Your father, I understand, was a professor of pharmacology mm -hmm. and established the National Poison Centre in some yes, of the 60s. Mm -hmm. And your mother was one of the grand old teachers of Columba and uh, was actually in my parents' minds, and my mother and my aunt's minds, actually, um, one of the great influences in their lives. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing in Dunedin in those early stages, um, in such an academic, mm. such a brilliant family, if you're honest? I was very lucky. Um, my parents were both teachers, and that probably made a great difference to the, to the way that they brought me up, I'd say. Um, our family was sort of divided down the middle between arts and science. The male side of it was science and the female side was arts. And that's the way it was anyway, at, in the beginning of our generation. My mother was a teacher at Columba uh, from when I went to Columba at the age of about 12, 13, uh, until I left Columba. Uh, she taught me for several years. And then actually I went back to Columba after my university training and um, taught there myself. And all I had to do was remember what mum did and just be exactly the same. Mm. Which really involved making a bit of an idiot of yourself, not an idiot of yourself, but you know, being relaxing in front of a classroom just as I should be relaxing now and speaking um, about the language that you want to, uh, to teach to somebody with love and with uh, appreciation, and uh, that certainly came across to me. And I know in the school she was, she was a beloved person. Mm. And my father was a slightly more uh, traditional sort of, uh, well, he was a Scotsman, Scots-Australian, and um, a lecturer in pharmacology and um, at the medical school. And he was probably um, a great influence on my, my brother's uh, development as a physicist. Uh, but also on mine because he loved language. And what I remember about him um, very early on is reading us all the poems that you will know um, and how Horatius kept the bridge and, um, come on, what's more? Uh, the ones that you read aloud, all the old Victorian poems, mm. um, The Inch Cape Rock, um, oh gosh. Into the Valley of Death. The, <laughs> into the Valley of Death Road, mm. yes, <laughs> 600. <laughs> Um, all of those things, uh, enjoying the rhythms and the rhymes of Victorian poetry and declaiming them um, with gusto. And so those, those were deeply ingrained in, in us, I think. And my mother, perhaps her contribution to the poetic side of my nature was probably A. A. Milne to begin with, who I still love, the simplicity, and Shakespeare. Uh, now, what else? Well. What else can I say there? About what about your family today? Um, you have a number of members of your family who are very reputable in scientific fields. You've mentioned Malcolm. Mm -hmm. Malcolm um, ended up as an astrophysicist. And he and I have discussed astrophysics since I was at least two. Mm. <laughs> He's 18 months older than me and quite didactic in a way. Um, still extremely interested in anything to do with the universe and things. And he was the person who introduced me to the idea of infinity, which I think about all the time, really. And when I was very, very young, it was a fascinating um, concept to sit and think about infinity. That meant that I didn't have any trouble um, accepting the idea of God, because that slotted into infinity very nicely. And uh, although I'm disnumerate and extremely um, unable to explain 
the physics and the uh, science that I abs um, uh, absorbed from him, um, I think uh, <laughs> I, I, I absorbed it through our conversations mm. in, a, in a early, early years. Yeah. That certainly shows through in a number of your poems throughout the uh, time you've been writing, poems that refer to different concepts derived from physics. Mm -hmm. um, so <coughs> when did you begin university? 1966. 1966. And what were you studying at that stage? I was studying English, German, philosophy, um, uh, uh, not history, English, French, mainly French, and I majored in French because oh. my mother was a French teacher and... It was easy for me. Were you writing poems by the time you came to university? Uh, only the ones that you write at school for the school magazine, mm -hmm. um, but not, not really with anything other than a, a school English type. You I recall in a poem, I don't believe it's included in Poeta, a poem in which you met James K. Baxter at university? Mm -hmm. I did. And I was one of his earliest um, mm -hmm. admirers. Well, he was, in fact... What, what I really thought about him was that he was the first real, live, living, genuine poet that I had ever met. And I didn't even know that sort of thing existed. Like all the rest of us, I thought that they existed in books and dead. But then I was told that there was somebody uh, alive and writing. And I didn't know anything about his poetry, or about him particularly. But because he was a poet, I... I um, I, I really thought he was fantastic. And I went to visit him in his Burns Fellow office at least twice, maybe three times. And um, somehow he sparked a delight in poetry um, just from his own intensity and interest. Mm -hmm. And interest in me as a possible poet, I think. He started me reading Fleur Adcock, told me not to read Curnow. <laughs> I don't, that had nothing to do with me. That was the sort of... Um, generation before of uh, the problems they had between mm. them in terms of talking about poetry. Mm. Um, so I didn't read Kuno for years. Um, but I did read Fleur Adcock. I read Ruth Dallas. Mm -hmm. I read um, as many New Zealand poems as I possibly could. And it seemed to me that New Zealand poetry was very, very interesting and much more relevant to me than the, um, than the school-type poetry that I encountered. If you'll correct me if I'm wrong here, but sort of around that period of time, I'm talking sort of like the mid-late 60s through to the mid-70s, mm -hmm. there are a large number of people whom you were associating with who subsequently became luminaries in different forms of art, including poetry, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, some of the people who down here are rough hotary, of course. Um, Hone Tufare. We have Marilyn Webb here, um, Joanna Margaret Paul, the Carries. Uh, can you tell us how you got to know some of these individuals? Well, the, um, the Globe Theatre was a tremendous uh, um, hub, really, of artistic and theatrical and literary interest in the 60s. And as, gosh, I was an enthusiastic little person about that time. I mean, I still am enthusiastic, but I sort of look back on myself and think, gee, you know, rushing off to the Globe, insisting on doing voice lessons with <coughs> Rosalie Carey, for which I thank her forever, um, going to Friday night classes in theatre with Patrick Carey, during which he, he simply talked about world theatre on and on and on, and we <laughs> soaked it up, and it was absolutely marvellous. And to the Globe at that point, a lot of university staff a lot of university students and people uh, came and hoped for parts, small parts, in um, some of the productions, which were going on all the time. Like almost every couple of weeks, there was a new production um, of the great, enormous um, gamut of, of world theatre. My first, um, <laughs> here I go, my first role, of which I was inordinately proud was as May Rose Cottage in uh, Dylan Thomas's Under Milkwood. Oh, right. mm. And what I had to do was dress up in a sort of a fetching outfit. I was only 16, I think. <laughs> and put my head underneath the... I don't know, somehow going through curtains 
and my, I had my one line, which was, I'll sin till I blow up. See, <laughs> <laughs> why it's a great line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Now, so in those early years, in your first books of poetry, um, uh, much of the work in those books, of course, was written prior to the publication, and well prior to the publication. You've just mentioned beforehand the influence of science and physics through your family. Just wondering, when did those influences first show up in your writing and your poetry? Probably in my second book, which is my... A lot of writers say they have a naughty book or an annoying book or one that they rather wish they hadn't published quite so quickly. That's Anti-Gravity, my second book. And that was when I was realising that um, through our continuing conversations with, with Malcolm and me, mm. um, that physics and the inexplicability of the universe and of uh, elementary particles and all the extraordinary things that were being um, invented was best spoken about in an equally fluid and, and uh, elusive sort of way uh, as poetry. And um, it just seemed to me that me being the poet and him being the physicist, poetry was the way that I could understand things which were really logically hopeless um, to understand. And I'm not logical at all, or mathematical. Um, so that's about when it started, I think. Uh, although, in fact, the idea of the meniscus um, was something that um, appealed to me and mm. began in a poem um, called To Ben at the Lake mm. when uh, I was with Marilyn's son, Ben Webb, uh, at Mahinarangi mm. some years later with Ralph and um, Andrea. Um, yeah, well, there's, gosh, there's thousands of things I can say. I was just thinking in relation to those years in Dunedin, um, the early work shows a great deal of the influences of physics, but also of quasi-philosophical things. Now, when you and I were discussing the ver your associations with different parts of the world, the, what I've described just as the theme of place, living here, as you've described in your book of poetry, you referred in 1985 to having a month-long discussion with the late Martin Eslin in San Francisco as a Fulbright scholar. I'd like to tell us a little bit about that. Who was Martin Eslin? I came across him because when I was doing my... <coughs> excuse me, my... Um, uh, MA in, in French literature. I'd been studying the um, early 20th century French literature of Camus, Sartre, Beckett, Genet, Ionesco, and uh, several others, seven or eight uh, others. And um, one of the books that I read which influenced me was Martin Esselin's book on the <coughs> theatre of the absurd. And when it came, when I, when I was given the chance to uh, to apply for a Fulbright to go and speak to him, I took it up straight away. And that was rather a marvellous month in um, San Francisco at Stanford, where he was emeritus professor by that time. And he had plenty of free time and seemed to take me out to lunch every single day <laughs> and simply talked to me and talked and talked and talked about theatre. And my particular interest was radio drama. And we were talking about the subtlety of language and the way that spoken language can get across a great deal um, if you write it properly or you use it properly. He'd been uh, involved with propaganda, anti-Hitler uh, uh, propaganda in the Second World War where after he'd escaped from Vienna and um, that interested me too and I have antennae for propaganda now and I hear it everywhere. Uh, on the radio, television, in politics, all sorts of things. And it all comes back to language. It's language which is, is driving that and is incredibly effective. Uh, if you choose your language well, you can, you can make people think things that they didn't know they thought. So that's actually one of the other things uh, that I learned, that it's a responsibility if you're a poet or anybody who speaks or, or writes or paints or anything, a certain social responsibility because you have to know that the work that you produce, if it's very good, and it has to be very good, um, will actually influence people's minds. And you don't want to do it wrong. Well. Can I ask, Christian, in relation to you, you described it as a, a month-long conversation mm. with Mr. Islam, Professor es Islam, I think he was, anyway. Um, I can think of a number of poems of yours where there is something 
dialogical in the poem. I think of a walk upstream by way of example. Do conversations have any particular role to play in, in what you conceive a poem to be? Is there anything, anything that you take from the concept of conversations per se? Well, presumably, mm-hmm. I'm having a conversation with myself as I'm writing. Yes. Um, there's the critical self that any poet will know, any writer will know, any artist will know, um, which is always asking back what you're doing. And then there's the intuitive self, which is trying to put something unsayable into the medium that you've chosen to use. And so in a way that uh, I've also become a very good listener, a better listener now than I was when I was a student, I think. Um, I was more of an impulsive talker, perhaps, when I was younger. Um, but I learned to be a listener, especially with people like Hone Tufare, uh, who was a great talker and taught me heaps. And I learned to listen and be very quiet. And that's continued in, in Bluff as well in my life. Um, I'm constantly listening, watching, and waiting to learn something new not because I want to use it immediately in a poem, because I don't believe in that, but just to inform myself. Mm. I think there are two poems of yours in Poeta about Hone, um, Your Eyes and Letter to Hone. And I think it's Letter to Hone you refer to the Toku Toku, which was uh, given to him while he was Poet Laureate. They describe visitations by you to Kaka Point, and I assume mm-hmm. visitations by Hone, to your place in Bluff, mm-hmm. other poets have come as a sort of homage to you in Bluff, myself obviously being one of those individuals. What do you think about visitations by poets? Well, <laughs> 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 they're great. I, I actually look forward to visits uh, from just about anybody, but especially poets mm. in Bluff, because I don't see a lot of people. Um, and the conversation things come comes in there too, particularly going to see Hone at Hakaka Point. Um, I went for a visit, as you do to any friend, but also once again to pick something up and understand something, learn more, um, and enjoy enjoy the creative mind that one is lucky enough to know. I go and visit Marilyn sometimes too, I feel mm. the same about that, and various other friends who I, I visit when I come to Dunedin. Mm. Yes. It is very much a momentous sort of well, I don't mean to overstate the thing, but there's something implicitly momentous about, you know, one poet going to see another poet in his or her own locale to talk poetry, mm. to be, you know, to look focus specifically about poetry and yes. to listen to what the other, the, what the, uh, the, the hosting poet is saying. Well, that's, that's quite right. And there aren't very many people, apart from other poets, mm. who you can talk about your work with, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. If it's a visiting academic of some sort or somebody who's going to write a paper on me or, or something like that, then I tend to perhaps get defensive. But with a, a poet, uh, I know that they go through exactly the same struggles as I do. So. Yeah. yeah. I've just mentioned before in San Francisco. Now, I have a number of locations that I have stipulated as, place, as, as locations where the theme of place arises one way or another. Um, so could you tell us a little bit, first of all, about Avignon? Avignon being a place in France, of course. And uh, tell us what the significance of Avignon was in your life. Well, that was terrific. That was Ralph and me and Andrea. We had a marvellous four months there um, in a little villa called Ma Villa, right in the middle of the Rhône uh, on a, uh, a little island, very close to the Pont d'Avignon, mm-hmm. the old Sur le Pont. Um, and just had that lovely experience that anybody has when they travel in Europe of doing ordinary things like going to the market and speaking French and Mm -hmm. doing it all properly. Um, And that's where I started, I decided to write a diary, a journal, instead of taking photographs, the endless photographs that you never really look at again, that don't mean anything very much, to write even a small diary entry every evening Mm -hmm. was a good discipline, made me think about being a writer and um, made me work on my writing, perhaps for the first time really. And meanwhile, Ralph would be painting in the garden or drawing or doing watercolours or whatever. And uh, it was a lovely way to respond to place and influence uh, and history particularly. Yeah. And um, so this process of maintaining a diary has clearly been quite...
quite mm -hmm. um, helpful to you in the course of your composition over the years. Um, it's apparent in your penultimate volume, I guess it is, in a slant light. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, famously, in Berlin Diary too. So tell us about when you went to Berlin. When, when was that? Oh, when did I go to Berlin? Mid-1990. Mm. Was it 1990? No, 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 when was it? <laughs> oh, God. I mean, I'll tell you okay, we'll forget about numbers. You, you anyway, said I went to Berlin anyway. so, uh, on my own. Yeah. Um, and it was uh, with the intention of writing something. Well, it was, no, it was before 1990. Mm -hmm. 1988, 88, I think. Okay. Um, Hone had suggested that I go uh, because he'd been, before that, um, they ho the Germans host you very well if, and, and respect you as a writer. They're very interested in, in writing, as most people in Europe are. Uh, and it's happening here now too, which is lovely. Um, so I thought I would simply go and absorb as much as I could. Uh, I agreed to go to German language lessons at the Goethe Institute, uh, and for that they gave me a marvellous um, flat and uh, a place to write, and three hours, four hours a day of German language, and the rest of the time I was free to write. And my writing was just in my usual notebook, big notebook, um, writing down as much as I could about what I'd absorbed. And then it took a couple of years after that for the Berlin Diary to come out. Um, and it's only about a, a tiny fraction of what I actually did write. Right. But I've kept on writing diaries. It's, diaries have been wonderful to me. They've served as psychoanalysts and of recorders and all sorts of things all my life. And um, I usually, I keep them sometimes. Now, nowadays, at one point I burnt a stack of them, which were my, my own height, um, <laughs> which I got told off uh, <laughs> very strongly. Um, but it wasn't really anybody else's business. The, the journals had, in fact, done what I wanted them to do, which was helped me to focus my mind, and out of them I'd taken the poetry and the work that I wanted and the dates and the bits and pieces. Uh, and I didn't need them anymore, and I didn't really want, in 50 years' time, serious little insects pouring over my <laughs> worries, honestly. I've got to about, a num about number 38 again now, since then, and um, I'll, I'll have another burn-up eventually. <laughs> <laughs> um, a number of other locations on an international basis have a bearing on your life down here, down south. Now, I've listed here Scotland and the Hebrides and Roanoke. Can you tell us the significance to you of the Hebrides and of Roanoke in the context of your life in Bluff? Hmm. Well, they both come from my parents. Um, I'm lucky to know the uh, quite long um, whakapapa of both my parents. My father's Scottish connections to the island of St Kilda in the um, Outer Hebrides of Scotland, way out in the middle of the ocean, um, a tiny community which clung on there for 2,000 or 3,000 years probably, and little stone houses and um, a main street with, I think there's about 22 little stone houses. And um, my father's ancestors came out in 1853 to Melbourne. They saw the writing on the wall really what happened was that the outside world got in there and the young people realised there was somewhere else and so they took off to Australia, Canada, all sorts of other places. And um, also they had terrible trouble with tetanus, um, which was the scourge of the newborn babies. And tetanus got into the special bag which the midwife kept at one point which was made of a gannet's stomach and um, that wrapped up the uh, umbilical cord mm. of the newborn child and that happened so badly. It was about eight out of ten children dying at one point until they realised, but that was far too late. Um, there was that. There was also just the, difficult, the sheer difficulty of surviving um, on... Gannet's eggs and 
a little bit of this and a little bit mm. of that, um, which many of uh, all of our ancestors would have done. And that's what actually really interested me about Bluff, because, of course, they have the mutton birds down there and uh, the seafood, and they have, a, uh, have grown for many, many, many centuries uh, from a subsistence um, existence to a, a very solid um, ability to exist in the 21st century as themselves, which is really lovely. So I feel a bit like a St Kildan there, and also the, the landscape, the barrenness um, of hillsides and the rocks and um, constant sea and sky um, made me feel at home there. Mm. Um, the Roanoke, um, I don't know if it's Roanoke or Roanoke. I'm not sure. Yep. Um, that was where Walter Raleigh and Sir Richard Grenville, and I think it was Sir Richard Grenville himself, who was my mother's ancestor, um, planted the English flag in Virginia, which thumped me in the heart when I heard it, when I realised that I was responsible for slavery, tobacco, all the things and all the ills um, that have come from that. But of course, you couldn't stop that um, colonisation. And, um, but it has made me extremely interested in colonisation and in the, uh, the, the methods and the, um, the first contacts that people made with societies who'd been happily living away by themselves for a long time and the arrogance and all the things. Um, so I set to and did a little bit, little bit of work on, on both those sides. Mm. And because of those family connections, they're really interesting uh, to me and they, mm. they always come back to me. Two striking poems of yours that I recall, one about Sir Richard Grenville, um, that being a spectre, the poem is called a spectre. Mm. And then another poem, which I recall when you composed, was quite a controversial poem, Fuse. Um, these poems both have a, I don't like using the term post-colonial, but I can't think of a better term at the mm. moment. They have very much a bearing on your perspectives on colonisation. Mm -hmm. What's your attitude to Sir Richard Grenfell? Well, oh. horror. Horror. Um, but also, in fact, acknowledgement that we can't apologise, well, we can apologise for what our ancestors do, um, but we have to take some sort of responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was actually just uh, a super civil servant and he did precisely what he was told and he was just, mm. he was like that, brought up like that and would have never um, considered anything else. And Fuse ends with a Maori man being shot. It does, yes. Um, it seems to me that the consequences of colonial behaviour are still uh, coming back to bite the colonist mm -hmm. society. And they probably always will, even though we're making far more efforts now um, to, to put them right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It must be strange for you in that regard, coming from a city like ours, like Dunedin, um, which is known by many people as actually one of the more white, one of the more Pākehā um, settlements in mm -hmm. New Zealand, uh, you know, people have commented to me that actual fact, you know, Māori are more, um, you know, noticeable in Southland than they are in Otago. And I don't know exactly what the dynamics are for that, but it is something that I think certain people are quite conscious of um, because of our Presbyterian and Scottish roots. Mm. Um, I, uh, sorry, no. was, knowing Ralph, mm -hmm. of course, um, made, oh, made me very much aware yeah. of the Māori side of things mm -hmm. and belong. Um, to um, Māori whānau and um, the Māori people and relate to that uh, question of colonisation. And uh, in Bluff, certainly, I belong now to a large, loving whānau. And in Dunedin, I went to live at uh, Te Raune at the very end of uh, the peninsula there, um, a little house called the Flounder Inn, where I felt I was between civilizations. really. I wrote a long poem about it. Mm -hmm. I know that I've stated previously that I'd like to take questions um, for at least 20 minutes, and so I've just got a few little things that I want to ask you mm -hmm. before I hand over to the audience for any further questions to you. Um, there's a poem of yours called Wacky Language. Um, now, as you know, I've, you know, there are numerous works in Poeta which either expressly or implicitly riff 
off the theme of riddles. What is it about riddles that motivates you specifically to write poems after that fashion? I don't know. Um, you get in, it depends what you're writing about. <clears throat> if you're writing about something very straightforward, you tend to write a fairly straightforward poem, but usually the things that really intrigue me are very curly questions indeed. Um, motivations of, of people, motivations of, of, of history, uh, the reasons for things, um, big questions uh, that all poets um, think about. Um, so a riddle to me is not in order to um, bamboozle other people, but to make them think too that it's not as straightforward as it seems. Um, I've got this poem called Hatch's Legacy. We've got time I'd for me love to read you this. to read that. That would be great. Um, Hatch's Legacy is... And it does require um, quite a bit of explanation, really. Um, I'll just have to find it here. In, the, in my house in Bluff, outside the back door, there's a very strange old cast-iron bit of rubbish wreck thing standing about this high um, with a barely legible legend on the top. It's... Uh, 100 years old or so, completely wrecked. Um, it's got sides, and it's got a round thing here, and it's got little legs, and it's got a wee spout. And I didn't know what it was, and I was told, very seriously, that it had been a penguin squasher, which um, floored me completely. How and why and what on earth, and would they? Well, in fact, they did because um, I discovered that this particular piece of equipment wasn't actually a penguin squasher. It was a cheese press made by Carson and Toon in uh, England. And it had, been, it had come, I don't know, I mean, I believe a lot of things that I'm told, and I, I'd have to. I, it is said that it came to Bluff and was uh, used, uh, first of all, as a cheese press, but then also perhaps to get oil, because that's why... Uh, the former mayor of Invercargill at the turn of the century, Joseph Hatch, went off to Macquarie Island, had this he was a tremendous entrepreneur, went to Macquarie Island and over 30 years killed at least three million penguins and sea elephants and anything he could lay his hands on to get the oil, which was a very valuable commodity. He'd boil them up and squeeze and out would come the oil. And this is how I think this cheese press was actually po probably used when somebody really needed some oil. And so it's such a revolting and disgusting topic, and yet, in fact, so, um, so relevant to the way that we use natural resources nowadays without a thought, that I thought, right, I'm going to write a poem about this thing, but how do you write a poem about <laughs> A strange old cast iron frame that seems to have no sense to it. So I wrote a poem speaking from the point of view of this thing, and it's called Hatch's Legacy. You walk around me, scratch your head, and can't say what I am. Your mouth will turn down when I tell you. Thousands of your dapper friends I've crushed remorselessly. Kind gentlemen, who kept their children on their toes. That's the way penguins do. My work was not for my gain, but your own. A sturdy frame, four legs, a private spout. You see, I brought you light. Redundant, immovable beside your door. I can't work anymore. In fact, I'm fundamentally disabled. Rusty feeling in my limbs. Old age, of course, to be expected. Desiccating momently, I dream of my lost sweetly turning spine, my axle tree, squeezing the lifeblood from my victims. Perhaps you'll re resurrect me, reinstate my iron purpose when your oil runs out. Carson and Toon made me. Mm. That's about the horriblest poem I've ever written. I'm sorry to read it to you. It's a great poem. <laughs> Look, we've, I think in the blurb, for this particular event, someone referred to 
well, what I've described, the fascination of what's difficult, which is a famous line from W.B. Yeats. And uh, the sonnet by Yeats begins, the fascination of what's difficult has dried the sap out of my veins and rent spontaneous joy and natural content out of my heart. So basically, <laughs> sort of difficult poetry and kills the love. <laughs> now, um, I, I'd like to know, taking into account the fact that we are living in an age of extinction. Uh, I see on the, in the news today, Mike Pompeo, who the you know, a senior American official US, says that on the day, the headline was, the day the UN declared a million species to be on the brink of extinction, molding sea ice will open up, according to Mike Pompeo. New passageways and new opportunities for trade. Isn't that great? Wow. So yeah. the question I have for you then, Seller, is taking into account that this is a recurrent theme throughout your poetry, extinction and death, mm. what is it that motivates you to write difficult poems, so difficult poems, in that context mm. there, if everything is going to be gone? Well, it's a sort of a love of the human race, but an absolute disgust at the ability, inability to learn from constant experience uh, that we are ruining things, and everybody knows this now, uh, but and yet we carry on because we've only got short lives and maybe it won't happen till after we're dead or something. But it, I don't think that that particular attitude that maybe people who are students in the 60s might have had, um, I don't think it's going to go on for the next few generations. I think something's going to happen pretty bad pretty soon. And... Um, like, it's even hot sometimes in Bluff, much hotter than I think. <laughs> I went there because it's cold. <laughs> I love the weather. But boy, oh boy, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm afraid. And um, that's probably why it comes into poetry, because poetry really touches the things that you're, you're really involved with. Mm. I'm conscious now that we're actually moving into the last 20 minutes and that I would like to take questions. Um, from anyone who'd like to ask a particular question. I'll just ask point one last question in relation to this. <laughs> Sorry. And that's, what, do you, what advice do you have to aspiring poets, to poets in the future, in light of that? Oh, my goodness. In light of that. Well, it'll be just the same as poets, all poets. Get some sort of other stream of income if you can. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. all, because poets and artists, and as you will all know, um, do their work 24 hours a day and um, there is no possible um, payment for just wandering around muttering to yourself thinking. <laughs> and uh, $50 is jolly good uh, for a poet, poem being published, yes, maybe. But uh, it doesn't get very much higher than that. And um, you do it for love. So you have to really love it and you have to think, well, what, are, what better thing is there for me to spend my life doing than um, trying to understand? And, uh, write things down. Hmm. Can I take any questions from anyone? What a Scylla. I really enjoyed listening to you and, and I was really struck when you spoke about propaganda that you're hearing every day and I just wondered mm. if you could say a bit more about, about that. Language itself is, is um, a very strange <coughs> thing, as any poet knows. Um, and it can actually reach inside the minds of people who hear it or read it and it can move those minds. Um, in remarkable ways. Propaganda's got uh, obviously a pretty evil um, intent um, because somebody wants to move people's minds in the way that they want them to think. And um, it's everywhere. It's in advertising particularly. In fact, advertising, which began, what, the turn of the, of the, of the 20th century, I suppose, um, realise that people are malleable and able to be influenced with the right language. And we see it happening around us all the time now. Um, and that's the sort of propaganda. There is um, propaganda, political propaganda going on every, all the time, coming from various sources, of course. People speaking loudly what they think and persuasively arguing, um, all with the intention of bringing large groups of people over onto their, their side. Um, Martin S. Lynn was telling me, talking about that conversation at Stanford of uh, what his job on the BBC at one point was to record the, um, the propaganda po uh, broadcasts coming from Germany and 
manipulate them um, on tape and broadcast them straight back again. Um, like it was really quite a, a, a complex and, and uh, difficult thing. But I suppose it's the same as anybody sitting down having a conversation and speaking forcefully and trying to change somebody's mind about what they're doing. But this is large scale stuff. This is another, um, another of my preoccupations, I suppose. It's called Tourists. <laughs> and it uh, speaks from the point of view of a St. Kildan, um, because as, as I was saying, the, uh, for the St. Kildans were really um, ruined by the, the tourism um, that uh, changed the, uh, the way that they, they lived, their normal life, because they were acting up for the camera. Tourists. At the least, the tourist brings the boat cold. We have little immunity from the world's disease. Curiosities, we climb the cliffs for their amusement, accept their coins and give them gannets eggs, while the shadows of our ancestors bloom at our heels along the cliffs that take our breath away as the tourist takes away our marrow. Another question for you. Um, well, I was actually going to be asking about drawing and poetry. Mm -hmm. Taking into account, Marilyn, Marilyn Webb um, has had a long creative friendship with Silla. Many of you already yeah. know that. Um, Marilyn has produced a number of works which incorporate poems. I have, um, thank you, Marilyn, anyway, a, a canvas um, of a poem of yours, Our Cow, Our cow. which ends with mm -hmm. a sacred to the deity whose name is lost. Mm -hmm. What is the attraction of producing both poems which have a physical aspect to them and drawing to you. It's clearly something which motivates you and sometimes it's quite obscure. Um, there's a poem in here called Bird Text, which is just a whole lot of squawks. Yes. Uh, there's the famous yeah. dog wobble poem, of course, yes. of which yes. I am reliably informed um, the poet does not like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know of a drawing of yours too, which purports to be bird writing anyway, scratches right, and yes, marks across yes, her. That's right. Tell us a little bit about your drawing career. Well, I don't know. That because of living with Ralph for such a long time and knowing Marilyn and many other artists and people, um, it seems to me that the, the muscles that we use creatively are very much the same, whether it's uh, in art or in, in writing. Um, and um, there's another line I've written in one of the poems, early poem, about putting something into line that the words are not fluent, fluid enough for. In other words, going out and drawing the peninsula uh, with actual line rather than trying to find words for that. And I think that really, in fact, to draw brings out or draws out uh, the ideas that you have, especially when you're particularly interested in seeing and, and watching and looking at the enormous beauty of the world. By the way, Dog Wobble was written in the octagon, sitting in the car, um, watching a little dog sitting outside the tip-top milk bar, which was on that corner over there. Um, and um, it was wagging itself to pieces anyway when it's <laughs> person came out. What about some of the field form poems? Field form poems are poems spread out across the page. Um, commonly, people producing field form poems are harking back to really what started off as a French 19th century tradition with a poet, Guillaume Apollinaire, Mm -hmm. and then into the 1950s, 1960s, uh, with the Black Mountain poets, who were um, poets associated broadly with uh, the Black Mountain School, most famously Charles Olson. In your book, Poeta, at the end, there are six field form poems dedicated mm -hmm. to Marilyn. Um, could you tell us about what creative preoccupation you had that drove you to write that type of poetry, which is very much, as I say, an object on the page. It's not mm. simply... It's something you can look at as much as read. Um, well, I was writing those for, uh, for Marilyn's um, catalogue for the exhibition um, and thinking about how she works. Uh, and this, again, this is just putting into line what the words are not fluid enough for. The actual putting the words on the page in a, a field rather than in a lot of lines gave me the idea, uh, it made me think about the way that Marilyn works, really, um, or any artist does, on a different type of, on a canvas, 
on a, with colour, with a line, um, rather than with words, as I do. Um, so I spread them out, just in annoyance, really, with myself on the page, and then realised that I could read them along, or I could read them down the page, or I could read them this way. And in fact, a small poem on the page can turn into an enormous long poem mm. uh, if you read them all in different ways. Yeah. So that's started that. I was interested in, in you were talking about um, listening and watching and uh, not speaking so much, but I was also interested in what you were talking about the pro in terms of propaganda and how do you remain informed and without being influenced by that propaganda that we're constantly... Good question. Um, mm. Yeah, that we're constantly bombarded um, with. Yeah, probably because I'm listening to it critically. Um, because you're a poet, you're listening to everything anybody says um, and seeing what the words are actually doing and what's really underneath the words and what you really mean. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm pretty hard to, um, to sway. I don't, as a poet, hold any particularly strong political views because I think that as a poet I need to be neutral and uh, I keep that way uh, which perhaps also stops me from getting swayed from one thing to the other. Look at social media? Do you look at no. the internet very much? No. 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 Hate it. Yes. <laughs> I do if I have to for email um, or if I want to look something up on Google. Uh, the structure of the benzene molecule which mm. I asked Richard, please not to ask me to explain. <laughs> I did know at one point. Um, but I think the huge, horrible blandness of it is, is quite frightening. And there you will find, of course, um, enormous instances of propaganda and efforts to sway people in huge swathes, millions of likes, and people trying to make people you know, all think the same. Um, and the power of it is absolutely astounding and very frightening. I realise I just made a little mistake before. Guillaume Apollinaire, sorry, early 20th century poet, I meant Stéphane Malamé. Just wondering, are you, do you still read French writers? Do I read French writers? Mm. I don't really get much chance to find them. I've got a whole lot of old French books at home. Mm -hmm. And um, when I need a book to read, which is quite often, at night particularly, I just grab one and mm. just read it. And so I still in tune with that, um, that particular cast of mind. Yes. And I think the French that I have learnt and read uh, has influenced the way that I write mm -hmm. because there's a sort of meticulous craft about it which I think comes from there. All right. I'm conscious that we're coming towards the end of our session. Are there any other questions after which I'm going to invite Scylla to read some final poems? Does anyone have any questions I'd like to ask? If not... We have a convenient five minutes for you to read some other poems if you'd like. Oh, it's not five minutes, is it? I was just going to read you homing in, actually. Oh, well, here's another one. <laughs> well, here's two. This is a really nice book, Rachel. Thank you very much for publishing it. It's so lovely to... Oh, it's good. Uh, one about first contact. <laughs> Captain Cook in Luncheon Cove. It was so calm and dusky sound that Captain Cook requested luncheon served ashore. Beside the frothing pool of a stream tumbling out of the bush where sunlight filtered down and cool air sprang from amber peaty water edged with rock and fern. His linen white, his table set with silver. Captain Cook had an eerie, solitary feeling as if he had set foot on the moon. Of course, there were people there. That whole idea of terra nullius pertained for a long time. Mm. And here's one, before I read Homing In, which is what I want to finish with, here's one called Lifeboat. A winning reputation as a tourist destination. This was written in 1995. The greenest lifeboat in the world. Close the shoreline, dock defend us, chop their arms off when they try to climb aboard, lest all alike be lost. Walk a tipu wake with sewage in his mouth. Queenstown slide off his lap into the lake. The monorail buckle under the weight of visitors. King Kong swallow his delectable actress. The banks collapse. The river flood. Some war begin. So that's the sort of Cassandra nature of the poet. And to finish off, here's my first 
poem in this book and one of the first poems I wrote, sitting on the veranda of the house at Carey's Bay, where I lived with Ralph and Andrea, homing in. Here again, darks falling. Stand on the corner of the veranda in the glass-cold, clear night, looking out to emerald and ruby harbour lights, too sharp to stay out long, enough just to greet the bones lying on the moon and two fishing boats homing in. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your attendance and for being a kind audience to our great guest, who, as you all appreciate, is uh, of signal significance in poetry in the South and has been for a long period of time. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Richard. This Dunedin Writers and Readers Festival recording was brought to you with funding from a copyright licensing New Zealand grant and with the support of ORFM. The festival receives help from many corners, but we'd like to give special thanks to our major funders, Creative New Zealand, the Dunedin City Council, the Otago Community Trust and the Lion Foundation.